it isn't a new opinion to say that the live action Avatar show just isn't great, but what I find interesting about the topic is the why. I didn't want to make a video covering the show, whether it was the best thing ever or the worst, I just didn't want to talk about it instead of writing the hype train just by talking about the animated show. And then I finished watching episode 8, and I had a lot to say. The show is a convoluted mess that doesn't know what it wants to be, and that leads to its downfall. Due to this lack of focus, the show doesn't know what to do, and I find that so interesting. The biggest sign of this identity confusion comes from how it handles adaptation and how it sets the board. It was a given that the show was going to need to be more serialized, and we would have moments cut, reshuffling of episodes, and even new content and ideas added to the show. And what would really set the tone of the show, though, is which episodes they would choose to adapt. Because we have a lot of the main beats which need to be hit, episodes which need to be in it. I mean, they were even in the movie which shall not be named. The Boy in the Iceberg, Kyoshi Warriors, Jet, the Blue Spirit, the North. We had a large amount of episodes which could be cut as well, even though they're very important for character moments, and some would inevitably get chosen. These episodes are considered good, but also served character development. I don't think anyone was really expecting to see an adaptation of The Great Divide or The Fortune Teller because they're kind of useless episodes on the whole. But there is a long list of episodes which have an undecided fate, like In Prison, The Water Bending Skull, Bato of the Water Tribe, or The Deserter. Bits of uncertain episodes, but I think the only one of these which we really got was The Northern Air Temple. And with the lack of these character building episodes, the show was a lot different from what people were expecting. I heard a lot of talk of people theorizing that episodes like Warriors or Romashu, Team Avatar would be split up, going over the beats of a mid-range episode, people doing different things in different ones, Aang's doing this episode, Katara's doing this episode. Instead, Team Avatar was together for a lot of the show, even when it wasn't really necessary. I don't think we gained anything from Katara being in the spirit world that we wouldn't gotten tenfold from the waterbending scroll being its own episode, or part of that episode. And Sokka being in the spirit world, well, it completely destroyed his character, and I have to rant about that later. And funnily enough, by having Team Avatar stick together in a lot of episodes, like Spirited Away, it only causes problems because in the next episode, for the plot to work, Aang needs to go and rescue Katara and Sokka, so they're out of the episode, the whole episode, because they're trapped, so by them being together, it means we have less time of them than if they weren't in the spirit world. Having Team Avatar together for more of the show could work, but it just doesn't with how the show is structured. By having everyone in there on their own as well also causes problems. Chet was completely butchered because he was forced to be somewhere that only Katara deals with when the point of Jet's original episode was he was a master manipulator and how that related with Aang and especially the rivalry he had with Sokka. Or the secret tunnel episode. Although, I was clapping when the song came on because it's the secret tunnel song. Really, it just felt like a waste of time to justify the characters not being with Aang while still giving the illusion that they care about him, like, oh, we need to rescue him, but I would so much rather see it be them dealing with Sokka dealing with Jet, or dealing with the Mechanist. And to speak more about confusion of tone, Omashu is a perfect example of an episode like this, or two episodes, for some reason, episode three and four. While I enjoyed them on my first watch, now that the show is over, feels really poorly paced with a very odd tone. Having Omashu featured in season one of Avatar serves a few different purposes for the narrative. It introduces us to Bumi, an old friend of Aang who helps them to context the passing of time. It's supposed to be a place of hope where Aang can still connect with his childlike roots, playing with Bumi or on the cards, plus being a place not controlled by the Fire Nation. And finally, it's supposed to set up a big twist in Season 2 where the Fire Nation conquers the city, destroying one of the last Earth Kingdom strongholds. And we just don't get that in the show. Omashu feels much more like Ba Sing Se mixed with Omashu. It has a very militaristic presence where everything is kept locked down. There is the sinister undertones with the kind of evil Boomy and Aang being arrested, the Fire Nation spies, which remind me a lot of the Dai Li. Jet is also doing his freedom fighting thing here, which he will later do in Ba Sing Se, so that he only does it on two big cities now doesn't work as well. And then the city is conquered by Azula in the finale. 
I like that Azula takes the city over to show her strength, but it doesn't work because as an audience, now we know Aang will spend like two episodes trying to get to Omasha in season two, even though the city has already fallen, defeating the point of there being a surprise after like two episodes, we're going to do it, we're going to do it, Aang's going to be a master, and then he does. And they want to fit too many plot points into one city where it dilutes the purpose of each one and waste an episode, the fourth one, because it needs to be split into two parts, which makes the episode of Omashu redundant because we don't even meet Bumi in the episode titled Omashu. You can say the same thing about this. Nor, they wanted it to be a patriarchy for Katara to rise up against, but then Yue can back out of an arranged marriage because she wants to, and there's no bitterness between anyone, nor repercussions. And then just the whole of episode one, I think the worst episode out of the whole show, because it has absolutely no clue what it is doing, it is contrived, and it's the biggest waste of time out of the show. We spend 30 minutes of the episode on a flashback, which kills the pacing and achieves next to nothing. We first start the episode with a pointless chase with a pointless character who we never see again for a dumb plot point. To try to make the Fire Nation seem smart, they spread a rumor that they are going to conquer the Earth Kingdom or they are actually going to commit genocide on the Air Nomads. It's a good plan in concept, but nobody was expecting an ambush. That's kind of the point of an ambush. We don't hear anything else about the Earth Kingdom colonies, which should have already been conquered in this story, which could have been shown as a sign of Earth Fire Nation aggression. But after Roku stopped Sozin, everyone would have thought that the Fire Nation gave up. So alerting people that you will be attacking, even if you're not going to attack the person you're saying you're going to attack, gives them time to prepare. It's not like they would have been protecting the Air Nomads instead. The Air Nomads still would have been open, out in the open, if they didn't say anything. So that wastes a whole bunch of time. And when we get more time being wasted with pointless flashbacks of Aang and the other Air Nomads, then we get a stretched out scene of the Fire Nation killing the Nomads, which was a waste of time. It makes the Fire Nation look weak with their struggle and how long it took, even though they were under the power of the Comet, which should have made them invincible. And... Aang's part in this episode is just the worst thing. Worst of all, suddenly he can fly. It doesn't seem like a big deal, but firstly, it underestimates Legend of Korra, but it's also something that he just can't do after this. He just flies for some reason in this episode, and then never again. It's really Aang also never runs away from the nomads. I guess that would make him feel like too much of a, well, a kid. So instead, he goes for a walk seconds before the Fire Nation attack. Because it would make so much more sense for Aang going on a walk a second before the Fire Nation attack. That would save him, and instead of him running away days before. Running away days before, no, that makes no sense. Aang was just going for some fresh air. It feels so much more cartoony, like something from a Mr. Magoo cartoon. But all these flashback scenes take away from what the episode was about establishing Team Avatar. Everything in the Southern Water Tribe feels very disjointed, and when we return to the Southern Air Temple for Episode 3, we spent a comically small amount of time there. The episode couldn't balance the lore with the narrative, and it isn't sure which to favor. It also makes Aang too boring by giving him a tragic backstory first, while also wanting him to be less culpable, a decision which they retract in future episodes. Do you see what I mean about the show being confused? It has great ideas, but we can't choose which ones we focus on and which to abandon. Plus, since they seemingly don't have a great game plan going forward, they need to shove in certain elements because they might be necessary in the future. Like, I think the only reason we have the mechanist is because, oh well, for a uh, day of Black Sun, he needs to be there so he can build those boats that go under the water even though he feels forced into the narrative not really having a great place, even though I love Danny Pudi and he gave a good performance. Or another egregious case of indecision comes with the Avatar spiritual side of the show. The show wants to focus much more on the spiritual side of the Avatar, having Aang meet Kiyoshi, Roku, and Korok, even though Kiyoshi is the only one who really adds anything to the story, in my opinion at least. But they aren't actually focusing on what the Avatar's goal is. Mastering the four elements. Aang never waterbends, even though it is literally the water book. And if he's not learning waterbending, he's definitely never touched firebending in this show. Even though Aang's experience of burning Katara is a massive part of his art. And it sucks that we don't get it. 
So, when is Aang going to learn waterbending? If it's in between seasons, that's going to suck. If it's in season 2, there's less time for earthbending, which causes the psyche to repute anew. Well, then when is he going to have time for earthbending? And then when is he going to have time for firebending? Again, lack of vision. But we need to take a back... We need to take a step back from the narrative because when it comes to characters, there is no comparison for lack of focus. I want to start off with one simple question. Who is Katara in the show? I'm being serious. I don't know. If you ask me to describe her, I wouldn't be able to say anything. And before we go send hate to a bunch of child actors starting their career, I don't blame them at all. The problems with the acting comes down to script and direction. Great actors like Paul Sung Hyun Lee who have given great performances in similar roles like Appa, it comes down to script and direction. Great actors like Paul Sung Hyun Lee, who have given great performances in similar roles like Appa, not that one, felt underwhelming. We had moments where Aang and Katara's actors do phenomenal jobs, but the characters try to be so many different things due to writing, they can't be anything, which leads to bad performances. I love the Sokka's actor, and he just blew me away. He absolutely stole the show, even with the bad writing. But that's something else. Back to Katara for a moment. Her character was so muddy. She isn't the maternal figure anymore. She isn't a she isn't a love interest. She isn't framed for being much more mature than Sokka. She we we're told she's a great fighter, which may be the case, but we never see her train. She doesn't have that feminine rage, so who is she? Netflix stripped back the layers of her character to a point where she's completely bland and then forgot to build her back up from there. Avatar has some of the most complex and multifaceted characters in television, but this just isn't it. Aang has the same thing going on. He isn't a pacifist as he accepts going into the killing mode at the end of the series. He isn't playful unless you count, oh, he has friends. He really isn't in tune with the spirit, seeing as he never healed Hebei, another main thing, which was cut. He isn't a mediator, since the Great Divide was cut. He isn't ambitious, because he never wants to learn bending. He isn't in over his head. He isn't confused and love struck. All that we are left with, for the protagonist of the show, he's a nice guy. The protagonist. Aang. It's not like Netflix can't make an optimist protagonist interesting. Luffy in the One Piece live action is an extremely interesting character, although I haven't seen the original anime nor read the manga. From what I hear, fans also like that adaptation. But out of the main cast, Sokka got it worst, because unlike the other members of Team Avatar, Netflix does add on to his character, but in the worst way possible. Specifically, the Episode 5 flashback. First of all, Netflix, again, strips Sokka of his character. Like everyone else, he isn't sexist, he isn't funny, he doesn't need to work to be a leader, but to try to patch that up and make it look like, oh, he has an arc, and give him trauma, we get a flashback, the one I've been hinting at all video. Sokka overhears his father saying that he is disappointed in him. You heard that right. When I first watched the show, I thought it was some nightmare zone, a worst fear manifested by Ko. But it actually happened. They cut Bato of the Water Tribe, an episode where Sokka really starts taking shape as a leader, and then they put Bato in here, but just replace it where Sokka's father being disappointed in Sokka. Zuko is supposed to have the disappointed father, not Sokka. He started the show as a good leader, and not much changes. What we have out of all of Team Avatar is just characters who don't feel like they've gone through any change, or if they have, it just happened off screen, or it's bad change. Zuko is one of the main characters who I feel like had decent writing behind him. One of Zuko's best moments is when he starts fighting Aang because Aang stole his journal. It is very funny, but it works because Zuko is still an immature child, and by the end of the show, he's already grown so much. I think he grows a bit too nice in certain parts, but I'm fine with that. I think what happened with Zuko and Lieutenant Ji was a really nice touch in this show, especially with Zuko's crew being the recruits, which cost him his eye and his honor. When Zuko returns to the ship in episode 6, it's probably the best scene out of the entire show. It's exactly what I wanted out of the series. It makes the writing so much tighter while not being afraid to change things. And I can give somewhat similar praise to Xiao. I think the acting is phenomenal. It is amazing. It's the best adult performance in the whole show. 
and his personality is much better than the original show, where he feels less like a cartoon villain, for the most part. <laughs> um, but where he falls flat is his backstory. He feels a lot less intimidating here because he lacks the seniority. He's some random general who got lucky instead of the ruthless general who climbed the ladder which we got in the original show. That was a big part of Zhao's character and one I'm sad to see go. Because of Zhao's seniority, it allows us to have scenes like the Agni Kai in the original show which is one of Zuko's most important scenes out of all of season 1. It showed that Zuko is a powerful bender but that despite the hate inside of him, he fights with honor. Zuko's cling to honor in this show is really dumb. He gets mad about little things being enforced like Lieutenant Time, so that's not bad. Treason. Or to return for a second about Aang being able to talk with the previous avatars. They want Aang to talk to Roku after Spirit World because that's something which happened in the show. Great. But it doesn't work narratively nor thematically, and it feels forced in when the previous conversation with another avatar, Kyoshi, does a much better job and fulfills a very similar purpose. Or something which made me audibly groan was how the intro of the show is handled. In the start of the first episode, we have a modified version of the season 1 intro, except noticeably worse. But then later, in that same episode, Ran Gran quotes the intro from the original show, word for word in the most cringy way possible. Every word felt like it was being said with a wink and a nod and I wanted to throw up. It felt super out of place and just killed the pacing. But then there are also moments where good ideas are shining through. For example, Katara learning water bending in the abandoned Fire Nation ship is a change I really like. I always found it dumb how the Fire Nation ship was booby-trapped since the ship was crashed or abandoned, trapped in ice by waterbenders, meaning people would have been using it just prior to it being trapped in the ice, so how would it be booby-trapped? People were walking around all the time, are they just avoiding it? It doesn't make sense. In this show, they use the source of Katara and the Water Tribe's pain, meaning the place where Katara can create hope, by learning to waterbend. It shows her fearless nature and her determination to learn. It's a great change, which I really appreciate. Or, I'm in the minority for this, but I think that Suki and Sokka work really well in the show, even if it is completely different from this show and Sokka isn't sexist, it's a chance for Sokka to stop pretending to be the best of the best, to humble down and to learn, and to plant the seed for what will be a great relationship, and the scene works for me for that, right, that reason. I love the bits where Iroh must come to terms with his past by dealing with the Earth Kingdom soldier, or how unfair things were for Iroh in general with all of that. It had depth and showed how the war was creating monsters on both sides. The show can have really good moments, but so often they don't work together, leaving them feeling more like flukes instead of the writers taking time to find footing, which shouldn't be happening anyways with the budget and the fact that they are adapting a show, so it really shouldn't be that hard. And to return to what I said at the start, the show doesn't know what it is about. At the same time, it doesn't know who it's for. The bit of news which filled me with the most dread going into the series was the showrunner saying it would be great for fans of Game of Thrones. I hated the idea and wanted it to be a lie, misinformation, fake news. I was happy when I started the first episode and Netflix said it was PG, because, but the show felt like it's in a no man's land between the original show and something trying to be all adult and serious. Because to be real, I'm not taking this show seriously when Sokka says to kick an old man's ass. That's the most edgy it can get, and it just feels like a 9 year old who tries to say something really offensive but just doesn't have the ability to do it. I think the biggest problem with the darker tone of the main cast is it doesn't feel like they're children. I was hoping one of the show's biggest strengths, the live action one, would be conveying how young everyone is. In The Boy in the Iceberg, the first episode of the animated series, each character is portrayed as immature or in one way or another. Sokka is sexist and xenophobic to mask his insecurities, Katara puts her all her hopes into Aang, Zuko is impatient, and Aang is avoiding responsibility. We don't have the ping and set sledding scene in the new show, which is essential, especially with a line I haven't done this since I was a kid! You still are a kid! <laughs> and then the Zuko training scene, which is nerfed because Zuko was perfect this time instead of impulsive and impatient to learn and just wanting to go further instead of taking time to master it, like what happened in the original show. I also just think the pacing in general in this new show 
is really bad. <laughs> there is the pacing of the individual episodes, which I don't like, but I feel like on the whole, the pacing was really awkward. One of the things the showrunner said about the show was that everything was going to be spread out more. They would make the journey feel longer and actually take more time in the story, partially to accompany the actors aging. But this season feels like it's happening over the course of a week as compared to the months it felt like in sight of the show. Since the show is so serialized, it's hard to assume that much is happening in between episodes, and compared to the show, which has so many more episodes, there's room for us to assume things happen in between. Like, at the start of an episode, we hear people talking about how Sokka was trying to date some Fire Nation girl, and I felt like I just missed an episode or something, because the show wants to be both serialized and act episodic, and it doesn't work. It's like, where did that come from? Because the show episode is serialized, it should be one into the next, into the next, instead of, the, here's one, here's one, and there's this stuff in between. It doesn't work. But worst of all, live action just doesn't have humor. We have jokes ever here again, but nothing compared to the original show. After I watched episode 4, I went to watch Jet because I didn't have enough time to watch another full episode, and Jet was just so much more enjoyable just for having jokes. You don't realize what role they play in the series until you watch an episode of the live action back to back with the original show. It also feels like the show wants to be for the fans with all the easter eggs and references to the books. We have the Secret Tunnel song, the Cabin Merchant, Wang Shi Tang, the return of classic m musical motifs, visual symbolism. But then at points it also feels too much like fan service. In episode 5, we hear events about the Great Divide had happened and a few others because like, oh, the Avatar was doing it, a few people said in the box. But it felt forced and took me out of the show. But at the same time, it's hard to say the show is for the fans when you butcher a classic, even though I know that everyone working on the show really wanted it to be great. I don't think I even fully realized how much I cared about Avatar as a show until this came out. Because of the changes and talking in this video, and the, ch the videos I made leading up to it, I realized how much of a big impact Avatar has on me by this being so bad, so it's not for the fans! And what we are left with in the aftermath of all of this is a show that can stand on its own. I can't recommend someone who hasn't seen the original to watch live action first because it undermines so many arcs and reveals in lazy ways. Though at the same time, this show can't be anything besides a live action avatar. So it's stuck again in a very weird no man's land where it isn't good for anything besides generating a boatload of money for Netflix. I think the worst part about the show is that we had all these great actors, a passionate crew, and it was wasted on a remake, which is destined to be much harder to make and much easier to criticize. I think if Netflix took a m more risky move and made a Kyoshi show for live action, people would have been a lot more hyped and would have fit the bill for what Netflix was looking for. Kyoshi seemingly is one of the darkest avatars, she lived for 200 years, so that means a lot of seasons for Netflix. It can attract the existing fan base as well as grow a new one. Kyoshi is also the most ex adaptable to live action as we saw in the episode 2 fight scene which looked amazing, plus it'd be much more cost effective to animation with how many crazy things Kyoshi does, plus I'd also be much more excited for Kyoshi instead of the earthbender after Korra just to get a new show on, though that's a discussion for another day. All that being said, I don't hate this show. Not in the slightest. For the most part, I had a good time watching the show. I think the acting was solid as well as most of the effects and the set designs. And I truly want the show to get better in season 2 and 3. We still have time to course correct and I hope we do. I think the neat reason I need to make this video and why I can't stop thinking about the show is because it is so mixed. I saw the live action Avatar film once and pushed it out of my mind because there's nothing there of value. But the same cannot be said about this new show. There is so much of promise that I just can't get the show off my mind. Individual scenes, restructuring, acting choices, which could have worked, but could still work going forward. I do think there is still hope. If there's anything this show will be good at, I think it's Ba Sing Se. Ba Sing Se is one of my least favorite arcs in Avatar, not because it's bad, but because it feels so authoritarian, it's written with such mastery, I feel uncomfortable watching it. So if the live action show can capture just a slice of that, mixed with the show's existing dark tone, the infiltration of Azula, Zuka getting the chance of a better life, the Dai Li, I have confidence they can nail that. 
Just don't mess up Tails Bossing Say. I will merge with the sea and get mad or something like that and destroy you. But I'm sticking with the original show because they execute almost everything better. One example of which being the Fire Nation. They are the perfect villains in the original show and to go more into why, check out this video.